Good evening. First song tonight be number 378. <clears throat> 378. I found my Lord and he is... <clears throat> the psalm before the prayer will be number 461. 461.
Would you bow as we pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And Father, we thank you so much for the words of the song that we just sang. We know that you understand, and we know that you will answer our prayers. Father, we know that it may not be the answer we're looking for, but we know that you will answer. Help us to be patient. Help us to be loving. Help us to be assured of that fact, because we find that fact in your word, that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We do not claim to be a righteous man, but we strive for that. We strive every day of our lives to do what you would have us do so that when we come to you in prayer, you will hear, you will answer. For that, Father, we are so thankful. We're thankful, Father, for the good news that we've had this day. We may not all totally understand what we've been told, but we believe it, we trust in it, we trust the men who serve as our elders. We trust the fact that they're watching out for our souls and help us, Father, to put our trust totally in them and accept the fact that they have brought to a conclusion this horrible situation that existed between two congregations of your people in this area. Help us, Lord, to be a forgiving people, help us to be a loving people, and help us to do all that we can to solidify and to bring about all the good that existed prior to this event that occurred five years ago, that we might move forward united in one goal, and that goal is to arrive one day in heaven after this life is over. And Father, we know that if we do not forgive, you will not forgive us. Help us to do that. Help us to be the kind of people you would have us be. Father, we thank you for this congregation of your people and we pray your blessings upon us as we strive to serve you with our lives and our service. Father, for those who are ill and unable to be with us tonight, we ask your blessings be upon them. Those who have been ill and are able to be back again, we thank you for that. Father, we thank you for those who have aged parents who are striving with health problems and health issues. Bless them, not only the parents, but those children who are suffering with the parents. Bless them, Father, in a very special way. And bless us as their brethren, that we might be able to assist in whatever way is right and proper and good and kind. We thank you for your precious son, Jesus, who is our Lord, who is our Savior, who is the master of our lives. We thank you for the fact that you were willing to give and he was willing to come to this earth to suffer as a man, to be tempted in all things such as we, and yet giving us the proper example, he did not succumb to that temptation. And we know that he is a true and proper mediator for us because we are sinful. We do things, perhaps even on a daily basis, that we regret, that we wish we had not said or done, but we know that we have one who is our propitiation, who is a suitable sacrifice for us and who mediates between us and you, our Heavenly Father. Bless us now in this service tonight. Bless us in all that we do, all that we undertake that's right, that's good, and that has the future of the church in our hearts. 
and defeat us in everything that we do or undertake or think or say that would betray that love that we should have for the church and for its success. We thank you for Sidney and we pray that you'll be with him even this evening as he breaks into us the bread of life. We pray that he'll, as he always does, stand behind the cross and preach the truth and nothing but the truth from your precious word. Bless us as we worship this evening. Forgive us where we've erred. We humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 273. 273. In vain, in high and holy lays my soul. When mark number 214, we're saying this as the invitation hymn after the lesson this evening. 214. <clears throat> Go ahead, stand and turn number 211. We're saying this before the lesson. 211.
in your Bibles to James chapter 4. This will be at least a starting point for our study together this evening. James chapter 4. Beginning in verse 13, James writes, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boasting, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. This is a context that we often read with regard to the brevity of life, and it is addressing that issue. It is also a section of Scripture that helps us to understand that while we are here, that we need to give our attention to things of a spiritual nature. He goes on in chapter 5 to talk to those who are rich. <clears throat> and he talks about the corruption that is involved in riches. He talks about those who have lived in pleasure, who have given attention to the ways of this world rather than to things of a spiritual nature. But in all of this, James is just simply saying to us that, that we are here for a short time, that we need to focus on things of a spiritual nature, and then when this life is over, everything will be in order for us. A few weeks back, I had another opportunity to walk the cemetery where my mother and my dad are both buried grandparents as well on both sides. And in that cemetery and on those stones, there are various sayings. And I enjoy to some degree just walking through and, and reading the little sayings on the stones of those who have passed. Now knowing some of the people that lived in that community and who have passed on since then, knowing the kind of life that they live, it is obvious that what's written on the stone is not characteristic of the life that they lived while they were here. And that's unfortunate. But when we think about that kind of thing, what we realize is not what is written on a stone somewhere about us once we pass from this life. But what can truly be said of our life as we live it here and once we are gone in that regard. Life is short and we are leaving a message by the life that we live. I mentioned and just alluded to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4 this morning in which it is said of Abel that he being dead yet speaketh. And that could be true basically of everybody that has passed from this life through their influence, through their children, through their grandchildren, through their friends, through, through family, through those with whom they were associated in, in various ways. Every one of them continues to speak. But it's the message that we speak is that which ought to concern us greatly. I want to just for a few moments tonight look at some things that are said about the lives of people who actually lived on this earth and, and record of which we have in God's Word. What's written on the tombstones in, in whatever cemetery was written there, no doubt, at the request of the family and their belief relative to the life of the one who's passed. But what we read in the Bible about various individuals, what is said about them is God's 
statement about them. And that makes it true. We don't have to wonder about it. Is it true? Is it not true? It is true. For example, in Acts chapter 10, and we'll just look at a few passages in random, at random in this regard. But in Acts chapter 10, beginning or in verse uh, 38, with regard to Christ, it is said that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now you just think about that one little phrase that is said in that connection, who went about doing good. I doubt if anybody in this audience at least would question for a moment that that was truly characteristic of the life of Jesus. You can go back and read the accounts of his life as recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then, of course, men like Luke again here in the book of Acts making some statements about Christ in that regard. But you read about the various times, points, events in his life which he went about doing good. The feeding of the multitudes. Even before he spake to them the word that he wanted to speak to them. He took care of their physical needs. Those who were sick, those who were in some way physically not whole, whether it be the blind that was made to see or the lame that he made to walk, whatever the case was, he went about doing good. But is that not to be characteristic of the life of every child of God. We are to go about doing good. In Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 10 especially, Paul the writer said, As ye therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. What does that say about us? It says that we're to go about doing good. Obviously, those who are striving to live the Christian life try to fill their lives with good works. I've often heard it said, uh, some who have said, I want to do all of the good that I can do and no harm at all in my life. Well, I, don't, I hope that none of us would deliberately do harm. Occasionally we might, unintentionally. But the child of God is going to do his or her best to go about doing that which is good. And then when we pass from this life, if, if that is what someone chooses to, to put on our tombstone, then wouldn't it be great that that could be said and said accurately of my life or yours. He, she went about doing good. Then again in Acts chapter 9 and in verse 36 we have record of one who was a certain disciple at Joppa named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Now again, this is Luke's record of what has transpired in her life. Thus, it's accurate. We don't have to worry about that. But as you read on down through the rest of that, that particular story, you'll see the evidence of some of the good that she did. When they brought in some of the coats and the garments which she had made while, while she was with them, that she had uh, made for some of the widows who were obviously in the area, but the statement is that she was full of good works. Well, there's not uh, basically any difference in that which was said about Jesus, one about doing good, and an individual's life of whom it is said that she was full of good works. In Paul's writing to Titus, a couple of passages in that regard. 
in Titus chapter 2 and in verse 14, we learn that Christ gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. So when we think about the fact that that Christ gave himself for us, that he has redeemed us from the bondage of sin, one of the things, at least in this verse, that is said is an end result or design of that is that we would be full of good works, that we would be zealous of good works. That would indicate to me that those who understand and appreciate the fact that they have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb would be constantly looking for opportunities to do good works, not just sitting passively by. And if by chance somewhere along the way there's an opportunity to do good, we take advantage of it. <clears throat> That's not the idea of zealous of good works. The idea is that we are constantly looking for opportunities to do that which is good. Then on down in uh, chapter 3 of the same book, Titus, verse 1, Paul encourages Titus to put those brethren in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Every good work. And so within these passages, you have those couple of thoughts. With regard to Jesus, he went about doing good. With regard to Dorcas, it is said that she was full of good works. And, and the child of God is zealous of good works. Again, I ask, if there was nothing more said about us, once we pass from this life, he, she was full of good works, would certainly be a point of commendation of which every one of us should and could be grateful that our life was filled with that kind of thing, not just here and there, but full of good works. Every opportunity that we have in that regard. Then in the second chapter of the book of James, he speaks of Abraham <clears throat> And he says in verse 23 of James chapter 2, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now that statement is found in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, that Abraham was referred to as the friend of God. Now, you and I are well aware that Abraham's life was not a perfect life. He made his mistakes along the way. We know much of the good that he did when he was called out of there of the counties to go into land that God said, I will show you. He left. He went into that land. Perhaps the greatest thing that we would think about with regard to his life in obedience to God when he was called upon to offer his son Isaac and the journey to Moriah, going up to that mountain, preparing the altar for that, that sacrifice, and was prepared to do exactly what God had instructed when God stopped him. As a matter of fact, his mindset was to do it because the Bible says he did. At least mentally he made that sacrifice, trusting in God all the way. But even with greatness such as that, or you think about other occasions in his life, for example, when, when there was the controversy between his herdman and the herdman of, of Lot, one of my favorite things about Abraham's life, in which he said, let there be no strife, we be brethren. Tremendous statement that ought to be reconsidered over and over and over again. There ought not to be strife among brethren. But in spite of all of those good things that could be said, his life was not perfect. If you'll recall in our study of the life of Abraham that we did a few years back in 
in one of our classes here. One of the things that we talked about was his leaving the land where he had gone, where God led him to, and went down into Egypt. He didn't go down into Egypt by the word of the Lord. And he misrepresented the truth while he was down there. He was basically given a military military escort out of the land because of his conduct while he was there. But yet he was still referred to as the friend of God. That simply says to us that God does not call upon us to perfection in the sense that we never, never make a mistake. But you'll recall that Jesus himself said in John chapter 15, I believe it's about verse 14, <clears throat> You're my friends. If you do whatsoever, I command you. And so it's just as possible today for us to be the friend of God as it was for Abraham to be the friend of God or for anyone else to be the friend of God. But think about that for a moment. When you pass this life, If someone could in truth put that on your headstone, here is a friend of God. What greater thing could be said? What more need to be said? Certainly gives us something for in our own lives for which we can strive in our imperfections along the way to indeed be the friend of God in every aspect of our life. But close akin to that is a statement that is found in Acts chapter 13 and in verse 22. When uh, this particular setting, Paul was preaching in Antioch of Pisidia. He had reviewed the history of Israel uh, beginning with about verse 15 and, and verses following. He had emphasized John's baptizing and the baptism of repentance in verses 24, 25. He talks about Christ being the seed of David, verses 22, 23, long in there. Talks about the word of salvation, verse 26, some of the following verses. But but in that lesson that he's preaching in Antioch, in verse 22... And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. Now, he's just talked about Saul in verse 21, and we know the story of Saul. And he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. God makes that statement with regard to David. I have found a man after mine own heart. Well, again, when we look at the life of David, we know that it was not a life of perfection. I mean, of all of the good things we think about about David, it's, it's hard to think about David with, without considering the sin that he committed with Bathsheba and the subsequent sin of having her husband put to death kind of compounded the situation, if you please. But yet in Psalm 51, you can read of his repentance of that sin, and certainly that's within the scope and the will of God, isn't it? When we sin, we repent of those sins, and we ask God's forgiveness, and he's promised to give us just that, forgiveness. But what an awesome thought that is. That when we pass from this life, someone could have written for us with accuracy a man after God's own heart with regard to David or a friend of God with regard to Abraham. Does that present any kind of a challenge to us as children of God? You remember Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, down about verse 5, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. 
Basically what Paul is saying is, you need to look in the mirror every once in a while. You need to take a look at yourself. It's easy to take a look at everybody else. But Paul says, take a look at yourself. See what you see. Do you see an individual who is a person after God's own heart? If not, that would certainly be a challenge to us. And it is a challenge. You might look in the mirror tonight and you just might be fully convinced. Yes, I'm a person after God's own heart. But wait till the devil gets a hold of you tomorrow or Tuesday or Wednesday. See, it's a constant challenge, isn't it? To continue to be that kind of person day in and day out as we struggle and strive to live the Christian life. Oh, what a great thing it would be if it could be said of us, man after God's own heart. Back in Acts 11, down about verse uh, 24, we find reference, well, you back up to verse 22, these then tidings of these things came to the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. You know, it's almost, it's almost tempting just to stop right there and totally change sermons right here. Look at that little phrase. When he had seen the grace of God. Do you think about that? with regard to the events of the last few days and announcements today. The grace of God makes that possible. But anyway, let's move on. That with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Now we have to understand the context here of full of the Holy Ghost, obviously, during the time of the miraculous. But there are a couple of other things that are said about Barnabas in this regard, excluding that statement. He was a good man and full of faith. Full of faith. Well, we know that faith comes by hearing the word of God. But he was a good man. Reminds us of Psalm 37, down about verse 23. When the psalmist said that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So when we read here that Barnabas was a good man, we have to conclude that his life, his steps, were those steps ordered by the Lord. What a statement that is. What a statement that could be about any one of us when we have completed our life here. And we're placed back in Mother Earth. It, it could be said of us. Here is an individual whose steps were ordered by the Lord. A good man. A man full of faith. Or a woman full of faith. Or a woman whose steps were ordered by the Lord. Think that presents any kind of a challenge to us tonight? To allow our steps day in and day out to be ordered by the Lord. Well, we don't have to wonder what those orders are, do we? We have the orders. We sometimes talk about the Great Commission as being the marching orders of the church. And that's, that's true. That's accurate. That's our responsibility as, as the church, being the pillar and the ground of the truth, the very support of the truth. We're the ones who are to uphold the truth in a world of darkness. <clears throat> and in that regard, full of faith, good man, having our steps ordered by the Lord. What a statement of commendation that would be in that regard. Oh, there are others that, that we could notice in that regard. Um, you think, for example, in Genesis chapter 5, 
and in verse 24, and this is a character that's mentioned as well in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 5, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch walked with God. Well, there, there's basically no difference in a man who walks with God and a man whose steps are ordered by the Lord. It's pretty much saying the same thing in that regard. While you will not find this particular statement found, at least to my knowledge, in the Scriptures, I believe it's an accurate assessment of the life of Peter. And there, there are some verses that, that we could have used, but this is one that, that I think of with regard to Peter. He had enough courage to try again. You know, when you look at your life and I look at my life, we obviously should think about how often we must displease God. How often we disappoint God by the weaknesses in our own lives, in living the Christian life, dealing with one another, whatever the case may be. We are just not perfect people in that regard. But Peter was one who seemingly was constantly falling on his face, if you please. Tried to walk on the water. Cursed and swore and said, I don't know the man, the night of our Lord's betrayal and trials. But yet in each of the instance in his, instances in his life where he seemingly fell on his face, he had the courage to get up and go again. It's sad when people conclude about their own life that I just can't do it anymore. I've tried and I've tried and I'm, I'm weak and I, I just don't think I can live that Christian life anymore and they give up. You need to think about Peter. All the failures, all the mistakes of his life. Yet he had the courage to try and try again. We need to keep trying as children of God. The instant that we say we are not going to try anymore, at that point, Satan can wave the flag of victory because he's won. We can't afford to give up and allow the devil to have a victory in that regard. Well, there are other passages, other characters we could Think about Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 when he said the time of my departure is at hand. I'm now ready to be offered. Here's one who was ready to die. We often say that in one form or another. I've, I've talked to people who were about to pass from this life who would make that statement. I, I'm at peace with God. I'm ready to go. And thanks be to God when that's the case. They're ready to go. That's what Paul said about his life. He was ready to go. Is that a challenge to us tonight? To think about that if, if this were our night to depart this life, that it could accurately be said he or she was ready to go because of the life that we've lived. On and on the statements could go. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 18, you think about the concept of a sleep in Jesus, and we sing about that sometimes. Or Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, well done. Or Revelation 14, 13, at rest. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 4 is walking with Christ in white. That was the promise to those few in Sardis who had not defiled their garments. It is said that they shall walk with Christ in white or the assurance of eternal happiness when this life is over on and on and on and on you could go with concepts from scripture of statements that could be written statements that could be made about those who've passed from this life and hopefully any one of those could be said about any one of us when we no longer walk the face 
of this earth. When's that going to be? We don't know. We don't know. We've been brought face to face with the reality of death twice in just the last few days. And you can pick up the newspaper most any day and read the obituary section and you're brought face to face with death on a constant basis. I get amazed sometimes when you ask somebody, well, how are you doing? Well, I looked in the obituaries this morning and I didn't see my name, so I guess I'm okay. Well, that's maybe light and frivolous on the surface. But when is the day coming that your name will appear in that obituary list? You don't know, I don't know. But wouldn't it be great if when that occurs, one of these statements that we've talked about tonight with accuracy could be said about your life. What a blessing, what a challenge that we face every day to be prepared for that occasion. Tonight, if you're not a child of God, what would have to be said if the truth were told at this point in your life, no one, I'm sure, would ever put on your stone, this person was not ready to meet God. Uh, no one's going to do that. But if you're not a child of God, that is indeed the truth, isn't it? Then that would be an accurate statement. As sad as it would be. But you can change that tonight. If your faith in Jesus Christ would cause you to turn away from a life of sin, confess that faith, you can be buried with your Lord in baptism. You can have the guilt of sin washed away. You can become a child of God. There is absolutely nothing that forbids your doing that except your own submission to the devil himself. That's the only thing that keeps you tonight from becoming a child of God. When are you going to say no to the devil? And yes, to the Lord who died for you. As a child of God, hopefully your life is the kind of life it needs to be. And when you depart this life, one such saying could accurately be said about you. If not, then why don't you change that tonight? Ask God's forgiveness. He's ready to forgive. We're ready to repent, turn away from sin, confess those sins. He's, he's ready. He wants to forgive. He wants all of us to be with Him in heaven. And the only thing that will prevent that is our submission to the will of Satan rather than to the will of God. Tonight, if you need to change the one to whom you are submitting, let us encourage you to do it as we stand together and sing the song selected.
uh, the announcement that was made this morning, and I did notice as people were coming out, a lot of tears, obviously of joy and happiness at the opportunity to be reconciled with brethren with, from whom we've been isolated now for several years. Someone made the comment coming out, I believe we have the best elders in the world. Well, I would have a tendency to concur with that. I've had the privilege, unfortunate opportunity, whatever, the, you can word it any way you want to, but I've had the opportunity to be with these men in a lot of meetings over the last five and a half years since I moved here, dealing with the issue at hand. I've heard their prayers. I've seen their tears. And I think I know a little bit about what they're made out of. We're so fortunate to have elders to whom we can trust our souls. I think we're very fortunate in that regard. I just want to say that publicly. The second thing I want to say is just something for you to think about. Again, in this regard, I know just from comments that have been made, times that have been here, that in time past there are a lot of, have been a lot of hurtful things said and done, obviously from everything you've said. And I know that at times as human beings from a personal standpoint, it takes us a little while to heal from things like that. But when you think about if, if you are a victim in this case and something really hard, harsh, cruel was said about you in this ordeal, does it compare with the crown of thorns placed on our Lord's head? And yet he could look down at that crowd of people who are about to take his life and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can we do any less? I say absolutely not. Praise God that steps have been taken to this point. I had it together pretty good until that. We're thankful for each of his presence tonight. We're thankful for all those who have been able to return to us from a weekend in Valdosta. We know that you enjoyed that. We're glad to have you back. Remind you of those that are on our prayer list, my mother, Linda Howard, has been moved to a rehab room in that uh, Tanner Hospital in Carrollton, room 283. She slowly improved. She's still in some pain, but she's uh, moving about, and hopefully she'll be able to go home in the next couple of days. Addie Hunt, Betty Gray's mother, continues at Higgins. What room is that, Betty? 241. 241. She's trying to recover from pneumonia. Barbara Cron is still awaiting some test results that are upcoming. Both Elise Tomlin and Sharon Duffy were sick at home today, and also Shirley Smallwood was is still trying to recover from illness and not able to attend with us today. Rosemary Evans is at Peachford Hospital in Atlanta for observation at this time. You asked to continue to remember Vesta Carroll as she continues at home. We also made an announcement this morning that uh, Maybelle Cash's brother died. What was his name? Brother Ham? Mr. Ham? We don't have any arrangements at this time, but Maybell Cash's brother has passed away, and that was last week. It's been a while? Three weeks ago? Okay. Well, we apologize for not having it sooner. You're asked to remember Frank Head's sister, Mae Zimmerman, who remains at Higgins. We extend our sympathy to the Richard Wheeler family in his passing last week. The family or the uh, church has received a thank you letter from the family, and it will be on the bulletin board for your review. Also to the family of Roger Jackson, who passed this past week. He was the nephew of our Ruth Tuggle. We also announced at this time that Sister Frances White passed away earlier today. This is Robert Edwards' mother. 
The visitation is tomorrow at High Tower in Bremen from 6 to 8 p.m. High Tower in Bremen from 6 to 8 p.m. tomorrow is the visitation. The funeral will be Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock at High Tower Chapel in Bremen. Again, the funeral, High Tower Chapel, 11 o'clock Tuesday morning. We will plan to feed the family after the funeral in the grave site here at the building for those who wish to prepare food and bring it. We will plan on feeding the family. Robert, if you didn't know that, you know it now. Should we mention any others? Brothers Keepers Group 3 meets tonight in the Fellowship Hall. Hopefully you brought your finger foods for that event. Our spring quarter begins next Sunday. Now this coming Wednesday night will still be this quarter's teachers and, and subject material, but next Sunday begins our new quarter. We'll have a potluck after the evening service. We're looking forward to that. Concerning that, Brothers Keepers Groups 2 and 3 are asked to administrate the potluck, group two to set up, and group three to clean up. Concerning our Brothers Keepers groups, there is a reorganization upon us. It is beginning next month, which is next Sunday. So they, those names have been reshuffled, and we have four new groups. We need four new leaders. We need two new leaders. We've had two to volunteer and step forward, and we're thankful for that. We need two more. So for those who are looking for a good opportunity to serve, this is it. And it is a very rewarding experience. If you have yet to do that, we would highly encourage you to do so. And again, for those who did not get the memo, we read a statement this morning of the reconciliation of the Brethren of Waco to the Brethren here at Bremen. So we are very happy and thankful that that is behind us. Should we mention anything else? Final song. 288 is our final song. The Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand and sing, go through this door, second door on the left, there'll be someone there to serve you. 288, let's stand and sing and be dismissed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for this opportunity to come here and to worship you. We pray that our worship services today have been acceptable in thy sight, and we ask you to bless us with a good week and help us in everything that we do to do thy will and let our light shine before others and bring them to, the, to you. We ask you to bless us and help us to study thy word and to learn more about how to do thy will so that we may be with you in heaven. Father, we ask you to bless us in everything that we do and we ask you to bless those that are sick and restore them to their health that be thy will bless those that are bereaved and, and we ask you to be with them father we ask you to 
keep God and direct us, forgive us of our sins, at last save us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.